First, I want to thank uh, everyone for inviting me and for that overwhelming invitation and, and, and introduction that really, uh, really makes me want to cry. I, I'm so happy to be even virtually in Egypt again. Uh, I've been to Egypt uh, eight or nine times. I feel very much at home there. My Arabic is terrible, but luckily most people speak English to me. And uh, it's just uh, inspiring, and I, I can't wait till we can all be together really in person again. So at least I'm virtually in Egypt again. And so here I've, I've been asked to a big subject, azoospermia. And you'll see in the rest of the presentations, there are many, many uh, sub-subjects of azoospermia. So I'll try to do the best I can just to hit some interesting things, though I can't hit everything. This first slide I'm showing you is interesting. It goes back to 1977, when before IVF, and we were just interested in seeing whether a histology, a testicle biopsy, could correlate well with uh, the actual sperm count in the ejaculate. And you can see there's a very good correlation, uh, extremely good, P less than 0.01. But if you look carefully also, you'll see that when the sperm count was zero, we did find in those patients a very small number of mature spermatids and the testicle histology. We didn't make anything about that until ICSI came along when Paul Leroy and I uh, and Andre Van Sturtigam and Peter Nagy all collaborated in Belgium in 1993 because once there was such a thing as ICSI, suddenly, this uh, purely academic histologic study we did in 1977 opened up the door to how we can treat azoospermia. So this is the hospital I work at, St. Luke's, and I, I really invited uh, all my Egyptian friends uh, to please come and visit us after this awful COVID thing is over, and it will be eventually over, and I can't wait to visit them because there's something powerful about direct interpersonal communication. Uh, we're the bridge. I, I believe doctors are the bridge across what otherwise can be difficult political barriers and antagonisms that really shouldn't exist. And so we are all a bridge and we love being that bridge. Now, this is just a nostalgic picture of Paul DeVroy and me with our with the very first test of babies born in Brussels. This was in 1993. And uh, it, was, it was hard to believe a year before that we'd be able to do this. Uh, but there it is, testicular sperm. Now you take it for granted, but then it was like a miracle. So my outline of my talks is I'll limit it first to the basics of spermatogenesis and some clinical take-home messages that may be startling on spermatogenesis. Second, I'll talk about the surgery, vasoepididymostomy for obstructive azospermia. Then I'm going to talk about the sperm retrieval techniques with ICSI, for azospermia, both obstructive and non-obstructive. Now, the Y chromosome is a huge, fascinating subject, and that's just going to have to be a different talk at a different time. Maybe it's my way of manipulating uh, the Egyptian Fertility Society into inviting me again, because I will accept any invitation. I, I'm so enamored and so much in love with Egypt. Now, this is just your classic slide of normal spermatogenesis. But if you take a look at it, you can see that the rim right uh, next to the, uh, the outer uh, portion of the seminiferous tubula, the basement membrane, is composed of dark spermatogonia and pale spermatogonia. You can see that easily. The dark spermatogonia have the spermatogonial stem cells, which is extremely important. The pale spermatogonia are the ones that divide rapidly and form progenitor cells and really are responsible for the huge number of sperm that are being created. And you can see pacotine spermatocytes and then spermatids. Uh, you don't see tails. Don't expect to see tails in most histology because the tail is thin and the head is thick relatively. And so it, it's, it, if you don't see a tail, it doesn't mean anything. When you do tests, you will see a tail. But pay attention to those dark spermatogonia by the basement membrane and the pale spermatogonia. And this is just a diagram so you understand the 16, uh, the, sorry, the six stages of spermatogenesis in the human. And you base that on the spermatid maturation on the top. And there's always that cellular association. 
And that cellular association is very, very important where you see you go from dark type A to pale type A and right around uh, stage four or five is where the uh, spermatogonia is sensitive to retinoic acid, upregulates the genes for eight and enters meiosis. So this anatomic structure is extremely important. So first, spermatogenic stem cells should be the most interesting to everyone. Uh, these stem cells stay in the basement membrane and they review themselves very, very slowly. They do not divide very rapidly at all. Now this slow cell renewal is important for all stem cells in the body really to limit the number of mutations over time because mutations only occur with mitosis. So stem cells uh, divide really slowly. But they make progenitor spermatogonia, which would be the pale uh, type A spermatogonia, and they really multiply at a very fast rate, but they cannot self-renew. So progenitor spermatogonia eventually are committed to making differentiated spermatogonia. Now, they divide at different rates, as I said. The dark type A proliferate very, very slow, and we don't have any specific stain for spermatogonial stem cells, and I can explain to that in a whole other lecture about uh, uh, the uh, transcriptome of, uh, uh, of, the, of the testis histologies that we've done. But for right now, all you have to know is we may not see them, but we know the spermatogonial stem cells are a colony within the dark spermatogonia. Now, the pale type A and type B are progenitors, and they divide at an extremely fast rate. And these pale uh, spermatogonia, which you saw in that first slide, are committed despite initial self-replication to only making differentiated spermatozoa. So here again, a normal p pubertal boy's testis has the spermatogonia, uh, even though he doesn't have FSH or LH yet. But after radiation or chemotherapy, uh, the pale and rapidly dividing spermatogonia are what's depleted. They're gone. If there's any recovery of spermatogenesis, which will certainly occur in 35% of these cases, it, we know it'll take several years. Well, why in the world is that? That's because the recovery of spermatogenesis after cancer treatment is from the slowly dividing dark spermatogonia pool, which contains the spermatogonial stem cells, the SSCs. Now, what about when you discontinue testosterone? That recovery is usually less than six months, because the pale spermatogonia have not been depleted. So it just takes the usual 84 days that I told you about for spermatogenesis to recur. Now, the SSEs can produce spermatogenesis and restore fertility if transplanted into the reedy testes. I'll show you a great slide of that in a second. But there should be no cancer cells in the testes of a prepubital boy with leukemia after his initial remission. The cancer cells are still there in the bone marrow, but not in the testes. The more sturdy spermatogonial stem cells, which divide very slowly, survive that initial chemotherapy and can be frozen uh, before the more extensive later bone marrow transplant. So then they can be thawed later on. The boy's cured, he's a man, and we can inject into the reedy testes. See, you can see the SSC survived the initial chemotherapy, but the cancer cells do not. Now take a look at this video. We're doing this now. This is an ultrasound guided needle injection of the reedy testes. Now, every anatomy textbook I've ever seen, every atlas has the uh, anatomy of the reedy wrong. It's really a linear collecting duct in the center of the testes. It, it's not this funny river delta near the vasa efferentia. It, it is really looking like this in all primates, not, not in the mouse or on the usual experimental animals. Now look at as we inject these SSCs. This is interesting, but not as fascinating as what you're going to see now. It will then colonize every seminiferous tubule. So the seminiferous tubules, just by that injection of the reedy testes, will colonize every aspect of the seminiferous tubules of the testes and resume spermatogenesis. So it is not until the spermatocyte stage that meiosis begins, and that's when homologous chromosomes line up. And on histology, all you really see are the condensing chromatin of these homologous chromosomes, and those are the pachytene spermatocytes. 
They begin to split in meiosis one, but are still held together by the centromere. So we have a four end situation forming pachyting spermatocytes. Like spermatocytes then separate from each other, resulting very briefly in secondary spermatocytes. You, you won't see the secondary spermatocytes on histology because it's so fast. You just don't see them. You see the pachyting spermatocytes in this stage of partial maturation arrest, and you see an occasional uh, condensed uh, spermatid. So what about hormonal regulation of spermatogenesis? Well, we know the pulsatile GnRH secretion, just like in the female, from the hypothalamus, travels directly to the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And it's very permissive. It doesn't regulate or control FSH or LH secretion whatsoever. It just allows FSH and LH secretion to be controlled by hormones that are coming from the testes or the ovary in a female. So with FSH only, and you had no LH, the testis does produce sperm, but a very, very tiny amount. We call that the fertile unit. That's the man who has a congenital defect where he makes no LH, he has FSH only, and he will have sperm even though he's a eunuch, but it's very, very poor quality. So LH is required for both quality and quantity of sperm. However, FSH is still necessary for at least initiating the completion of spermatogenesis. We gather that from Kalman syndrome patients. So spermatogenesis beyond spermatogonia stage does not ensue until puberty, and it really requires both FSH and LH. Now, um, i sorry for the misprint there. So this azospermia syndrome of Kalman's is caused by the lack of GnRH, which results in no FSH or LH whatsoever. So studies done a long time ago by Sharon showed that you can give HCG for three months or full year as long as you want. And you initially think you're getting normal spermatogenesis, but it's only up to the pachytene spermatocyte. It's maturation arrest. You still need to add FSH in order to initiate that completion of spermatogenesis. However, after that initiation of the completion of spermatogenesis by FSH, all you need is FSH alone for the rest of the patient's life to maintain spermatogenesis. So it's interesting and complicated. This is maturation arrest with HCG only, and this is maturation arrest with HCG only, and if you add FSH, the meiosis is completed and you have a normal formation of sperm. So now what about obstructive azospermia? I prefer an anastomosis. This is an anastomosis of the vas. And before we published this in 1975, everybody thought that vasectomies were just irreversible. But now we know it's just a matter of an accurate, accurate anastomosis. However, nowadays urologists who are doing vasectomies, and there probably aren't many, many being done in Egypt, but they're being done all over the world, and uh, they seal the vas really tightly. And there's continual secretion of fluid from the testes and the epididymis. And so that creates a pressure buildup. And that pressure buildup results in secondary blockages and blowouts in the epididymis. So nowadays, if you want to reverse a vasectomy, you really have to do a vasoepididymostomy. So, but of course, epididymal obstruction also occurs from a variety of diseases. I think we have the largest collection of vasoepididymostomies for a smallpox epididymitis in the world. And most of them came from the Middle East, but they came to St. Louis. And these are survivors of smallpox, all have epididymal obstruction. So this is the dilated epididymis that you see. And uh, the question is, where is the normal sperm? So uh, when we used to section the epididymis, you could see that there's no sperm at some level. There's nothing getting into the epididymal tubule. But if you go more approximately, again, eventually you get beyond the blowouts and the perforations and you get to normal spermatogenesis, normal sperm. Now these sperm are old, and so they're old, and they're, they're not going to be modal until they start traveling once again uh, through the epididymis and the vas into the ejaculate. So here are a bunch of pictures that I'll show you of specific tubule vasoepididymostomy. This should be highly successful. Uh, you're, you're very, very unlikely to have a failure with this inner canal of the vas being perfectly sutured. And there's a vasogram afterwards to show you uh, that we really have, it, it, sh it really is a beautiful specific connection. We do end aside now, and I'll go quickly through these so I can get to the other subjects. 
Uh, and MESA is part of that. We retrieve the sperm to find out where the blockage is. And then we do a perfect two-layer anastomosis. You can see the outer muscularis is first sutured. And then at six o'clock, we put in the mucosal sutures. And there's the second mucosal suture. And we can even do this for vasa efferentia blockage. There you can see the open vasa efferentia with sperm pouring out of it. And we'll anastomose that to the vas in the same way we did the epithelial tubule. And there can be a huge area of missing vas, and you can always free up the vas a long distance if you go to if you extend the incision into the groin. And uh, we wrote that we showed this a long time ago that uh, strikingly the Munster conception was like a life table curve, and it was, the results and the success was not based on the male because those were almost always successful surgically, simply based on the age of the female. And it fit the original curve uh, uh, that uh, of, uh, uh, recovery of fertility after contraception uh, in nulligravative patients that was originally done by Vessi et al. And uh, so not every woman is fertile, but there is a massive age-related decline. So let's talk about, uh, in some of the time we have left, sperm retrieval with ICSI. Uh, we do it all under, we do it microsurgically, but under local anesthesia. I think it's ridiculous to put a patient to sleep to do TESA and MESA. All you have to do is anesthetize uh, the cord and then anesthetize the anterior scrotal skin, and they can watch their procedure actually on the TV monitor. And then they just get up and walk away. I mean, they don't go to a recovery room, they just get, a, they just get up and walk and go back home or, or go to the hotel if uh, they're from out of town. So for obstructive azospermia, uh, we can do a good anastomosis, but also if you don't want to do that, uh, you can do a sperm retrieval and it works well, but watch out. So you all know that in the distal epididymis, we normally have modal sperm, but in the proximal epididymis, there's no motility because it hasn't matured via transport through the epididymis yet. But that's only in non-azospermia cases. When you have blockage, the sperm that are more distal are the oldest sperm. They're the most senescent. They look terrible. By the way, you'll note that this picture I, I drew of the reedy testes is totally wrong. I, I mean, the reedy testes is more of a linear thing going right down the center. So uh, the idea of uh, the anatomy of the reedy testes in humans uh, has been poorly displayed. But the rest of this is accurate. Now, if you look at the sperm uh, in the distal epididymis, you see a huge amount of sperm DNA fragmentation under electron microscopy. And that's only because these sperm have died of old age. They're the oldest sperm. If you go more proximally, where initially we thought we had the least mature sperm, that's where we find completely normal sperm with good motility. Now, they still don't fertilize well without ICSI but at least you can see their modal and their viable sperm. And we originally studied this uh, a long time ago and uh, 1994 and with uh, in vitro fertilization with conventional methods and MESA sperm, we only had a 4.5% uh, uh, delivery rate and a 19% transfer rate. But once we introduced ICSI with MESA in Belgium in 1994, uh, suddenly, we had a 94% transfer rate and a 36% delivery rate. Of course, pregnancy rates, delivery rates are even higher now because IVF has gotten better. But nonetheless, this shows the dramatic difference that ICSI has made, e even with viable sperm. But if you try to do ICSI with a distal epididymal sperm that have DNA fragmentation, you're not going to get good results because those sperm are dead. In fact, I hate to talk about DNA sperm fragmentation because it implies that's a phenomenon other than just senescence. All that fragmentation means is those sperm have died of old age and they're just not viable anymore. And uh, so again, to show you that we were kind of shocked when we found the only thing that affected pregnancy rate with MESA and ICSI was the age of the wife. Now, now obviously, that's obvious to everyone. In 1997, we were shocked to see that. So what about non-obstructive azospermia? Uh, we began to do that also in 1993 with microsurgery, and we began it long before the Cornell uh, enthusiasm for it, and we still do it differently than the Cornell method, and we prefer this method that we use, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, 
Uh, this is just, uh, I'm putting back up that slide of our original histology study that was, uh, that goes back to really 1977 when we were just academically interested in whether we could compare the quantitative histology, which no one was doing in those days, to the actual sperm count. And that's when we realized that there are some sperm uh, still in the testes that don't get into the ejaculate and non-obstructive azospermia. We think they're making no sperm, they're making a tiny amount of sperm, but not enough sperm to spill over into the ejaculate. So if you just look at a histology, it's a classic histology slide showing Sertoli cell only in the upper left and completely normal spermatogenesis in the lower left. And then in the upper right, you also see Sertoli cell only. So non-obstructive azospermia and TESA is not a matter of trying to find immature sperm. You will not be able to get success with immature sperm which are called round spermatids because there are always mature spermatids uh, in the human if there are round spermatids. So it's not a matter of trying to get immature sperm, it's just trying to find this, the occasional sperm quantitatively that are still located in the testes but not in sufficient quantity to spill over into the ejaculate. And so our approach to microsurgery is just to do no harm, not to dig around in the testicle and destroy the blood supply, but to sample every anatomic lobule along the surface. Because if there's any spermatogenic stem cells, you will find sperm uh, in the periphery where you don't have to do any damage. And you certainly saw that in the ultrasound that I showed you earlier in this uh, lecture if there's any spermatogenic cells in any anatomic lobule, they will find their way to the periphery. So there are degrees of azoospermia with completely normal spermatogenesis. You have, uh, all the tubules have sperm and uh, you, there's no azoospermia. But you can have non-obstructive azoospermia with only, with a diminished amount of sperm production. And you can have non-obstructive azoospermia with a severely diminished amount of uh, sperm production. So it's easy to get sperm in those cases on the left, but it's hard on the right. And for that, you have to sample every anatomic nodule. Now, digging around is not successful, and I'll show you why, and it's dangerous. So here again is an appearance of a Sertoli cell only case. I mean, there you can see there are no spermatogonia along the sides, but you see these prominent uh, nuclei. These prominent nuclei have a prominent nucleoli and the Sertoli cell itself is just an amoeba. It's an amoeboid-like cell. So when people were doing tests in the early days, they thought they were injecting around spermatid, but all they were doing was injecting Sertoli cell nuclei. So this is maturation arrest. But in 60% of cases of maturation arrest, you can see at 12 o'clock or at 1130 position, there are some condensed mature spermatids to be found. So whether it's Sertoli cell only or maturation rest, it's the same issue. You're not looking for some kind of immature version of a sperm that hasn't developed yet. What you're doing is looking for those small, tiny amount of sperm that are not being produced in a quantitatively sufficient amount to spill over into the ejaculate. This is another example, incomplete maturation arrest. This is how we do the laboratory dissection. And you can see on this uh, Pachytin spermatocytes, but there's an occasional sperm. You might have to look for two or three or four hours to find a few sperm because it's surrounded mostly. There you can, you can see is a Sertoli cell uh, nucleus uh, with a prominent nucleolus, but there you can see Pachytin spermatocytes. And here again, you see Sertoli cell nuclei. You can see Pachytin spermatocytes, but you also see sperm. So my message here is do no harm, and I'll show you how you can do harm. We saw a 37-year-old physician with a 33-year-old wife who had a preoperative testosterone of 371. Then he underwent a bilateral microdissection. No sperm was found, but he noted afterwards increasing fatigue, muscle weakness, and surgery. And testosterone we saw was only 84 with an LH of 50 and an FSH of 75. He was essentially castrated by his procedure. And this is what his reattempted tests looked like. Uh, all of his tubes are for fibrotic because when you micro dissect, you cannot help destroying blood supply. 
So what we recommend is, and you cannot tell, you can see thick and thin tubules. We really studied this carefully and uh, neither one of those is gonna be an indication of whether there's spermatogenesis or not. Because look at this, you can see at 400X, SEO on the bottom with no spermatogenesis. And you can see on top uh, tubules with normal spermatogenesis and uh, they're the same size. So the size of the tubule is only influenced by Sertoli cells and not influenced by the spermatogenesis. So we believe in spermatogonial stem cell approach to TESA because we know that there are, if there are any stem cells anywhere along that basement membrane that are spermatogonial, there will be some sperm coming to the periphery. So we sample all anatomic globules on the periphery and don't invade the blood supply. Here's a case of incomplete maturation arrest, and it is true that these tubules look fuller. They definitely look fuller. And you can see that they look full. But with Sertoli cell only, it is absolutely true that they look thinner. Uh, but there was sperm here that wasn't related to tubules that looked thicker, because the thicker tubule was just where it was making a turn in the periphery. Look at how yellow this all looks. It looks yellow because those are the Leydig cells. It's like a corpus luteum. This is the corpus luteum of the male, the Leydig cells. So you can see the prominent Leydig cell hypertrophy in cases of Sertoli cell only. Then we stop every bleeder microsurgically so that we don't have intratesticular pressure buildup. We close it with 909 and interrupted sutures. Now, this is the uh, round spermatid controversy. This electron microscopy shows you what Bob Edwards always taught us in those early days, and that is that the round spermatid has a prominent acrosomal vesicle that literally glows on phase contrast, and it loses that acrosomal vesicle and it begins to form a tail. So here's the early round spermatid with an acrosomal vesicle, and you can see that it was confused with Sertoli cells nuclei with prominent nucleoli, but that's not what it was. So if you look under phase contrast, you can see the actual round spermatids, but whenever you see round spermatids with that acrosomal vesicle, you'll always see the subsequent stages of spermatids. So how do you really know, is there any test for telling whether you're gonna find sperm or not? No, because there's hundreds of millions of sperm being made every day in the normal testes. And when we're doing uh, testa, we're just looking, we'd be happy to find 10 to 20 sperm. So, so far we don't have any adequate way, like with FSH level or um, uh, inhibit levels of predicting whether we're gonna have successful testa. Always be prepared to vitrify the oocytes because you want to have the wife's eggs ready and mature for injection at the time of the testa, because what if you only find 10 or 20 uh, sperm? You want to have her eggs ready. On the, on the other hand, you don't want to waste those eggs. Uh, and so be prepared always to freeze the eggs in the 40% of cases where you don't have success. Now, I'll just give you an example of Kleinfelters, and I only have a few more minutes because they're our most successful case. They're small little testes. And all you see, you, you see predominant yellow lytic cells, and you, there are only occasional little bits of a tubule you see. And look, look at that, it's just like all yellow. And you think there's no chance. And we close it up microsurgically so we need to do no damage. And this is what most of the testers looks like. But in 80% of the cases, you're gonna find an occasional tubule with normal spermatogenesis. Once again, you are not looking for immature pre-sperm, so to speak. You're looking for that tiny area where there is a tiny amount of spermatogenesis, quantitatively not great enough to spill over into the ejaculate. So this particular case I'm showing you had healthy twins delivered, and here's another XXY, and I'd like to say uh, the XXY Kleinfelter's patients are completely normal otherwise. They are absolutely, uh, this idea that they're retarded, less intelligent, uh, is just an old uh, myth uh, that just isn't true anymore. We see lots of them, maybe 15% of our azospermia cases are Kleinfelters. Again, you see, it looks like there's no hope in this case, but, and you keep looking around, there's Sertoli still lonely and there is just fibrosis. And then if you keep on looking, you're gonna find a few tubules of normal spermatogenesis. Close it up carefully. You see with our technique uh, under local, he's just fine the next day, he has no pain. 
uh, and uh, healthy twins and six more frozen. Now, Exo Turner's is also interesting. We, Turner's mosaic, man, you can see how short he is compared to his wife. Uh, but these guys are uh, otherwise normal, except for azospermia. They look just like the XXY. And I can go into this in more detail, the interesting aspect of this, when I talk about the Y chromosome, because this is what you'd expect. You would, you would really expect to find them to be normal. And there you can see all the Sertoli cell only, a sea of corpora albicans, and then normal spermatogenesis. And so again, we were able to close it up carefully so that we see no damage and he's making normal testosterone, uh, healthy twins and eight frozen blastocysts. And what are the results uh, of these with uh, varying degrees of azospermia or even severe oligospermia? Well, we find pregnancy success is not related to this quantitative defect in spermatogenesis. Whether the sperm count was less than 2 million or greater than 20 million or donor sperm, we did this a long time ago. We found there was just no difference in pregnancy rates or delivery rates. The pregnancy rate is, and delivery rate is absolutely not related to the sperm. Uh, it, it's really only related to the age of the wife. So that's, and also the ovarian reserve, because uh, you certainly have a more of a chance of having a, at least one viable egg if there are more eggs in ovarian reserve, but they are separate phenomena. So, what about the future of testing? I've only got a minute or two left in what they allotted me. In the future, we retrieve tested tissue from pre male cancer patients, culture the spermatogonial stem cells into multiple passages to eliminate cancer cells, or at least retrieve the test of tissue after the initial rounds of chemo, preserving the SSCs but killing the cancer cells, and then transfer these pure stem cells back to the testes. That's one of the great things in the future for TESA. And I, again, I, I show this slide that kind of mesmerizes me, but I've already shown you that. So I'll next, I, I don't have time, but I'm gonna tell you in another lecture that we're working on this now in humans. We certainly can do it in, in mice very successfully with a collaboration with Dr. Hayashi in Kyushu, Japan. Uh, and we can actually take a skin biopsy convert them into stem cells, convert those IPS stem cells into PGCs, convert those PGCs into uh, normal oocytes and normal sperm, but you need fetal somatic gonadal tissue to do that. And now we know how to do that with simple growth factors. So you, right now we're already making human PGCs from skin biopsies in azospermic men. And it, now the next thing we have to do is figure out how to culture them in uh, somatic uh, fetal uh, uh, testes uh, cells. So I think my time is up now. So uh, I should uh, go to, I think they told me I'll go to stop share, uh, right? And we can maybe answer questions if you like. And thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Selber, for this comprehensive uh, talk. Uh, great as usual and very updated. Uh, I will ask the audience to send their question to Dr. Silber on the question and answers, and we'll uh, ask him your questions. In the meantime, I, I need to ask Dr. Silber a few questions. Uh, the first question, uh, do you do any preparation for patient before TT, any kind of treatment, any kind of uh, hormonal manipulation, or you go straight, uh, straight to the TC without any preparation? We go straight to the test here without any preparation. Uh, we, uh, we, we don't feel uh, that we've been able to improve spermatogenesis with gonadotropins. Uh, and uh, actually in so many, in the Sertoli cell patients, the FSH is already elevated. So they've got their own gonadotropin elevation. Uh, in the maturation arrest patients, originally we hoped, we thought, that what you say would work, that if we gave them a high dose of FSH, we'd be able to complete uh, the initiation of spermatogenesis, but we weren't successful in doing that. So uh, maybe someone else will figure that out, but at this stage, uh, we are not preparing the men before the test at all. Uh, and what is your strategy uh, when you fail in, my, in, in, in sperm retrieval? What is your strategy with the patient? What do you tell him? Okay, so I warn the patients that there's about a 40% chance we're not gonna find sperm. 
I like to have their wife's eggs ready at the time because sometimes you only find three or four sperm. And we try to freeze those three or four sperm if we can, but it's kind of problematic. And, uh, and so we like to have the eggs ready at the time. But the, I, I warn them that we may not find any sperm, so what do we do then? I think those eggs in a wife who's maybe 24 years old are very precious. We freeze those eggs. And then who knows, in another five or 10 years, one, they might be open to donor sperm, or two, we might be able to make sperm from skin cells. But now we're gonna have 40-year-old eggs if we don't have them frozen when they're very precious, when they're still younger. So we like to be prepared to freeze the eggs in the 40% where we don't find sperm. Uh, do, do you have any experience uh, for RTC doing the procedure another time after one year, for example? Okay, very good. I think if you do the microsurgery right, so you're not doing damage, you should be able to find tessa every time, uh, sperm with tessa every time. In some of the severest cases where we really couldn't freeze any sperm, three or four sperm, they said, please do it again. And I would say, well, it doesn't look very good, we'll try. We go in again and again, and we've experienced that up to four times in fact, we had one patient, I was so sure we'd find no sperm because on the third time we found no sperm and we were all very careful not to do damage. That's the critical thing. So he was all prepared for donor sperm. He emotionally, it's four years later, he's ready for donor sperm. But he said, please do another test anyways. I'll feel more comfortable using the donor sperm if I know you don't find sperm on Tessa. But we were shocked. We found seven sperm, we injected it. They had twins. And in fact, the wife wasn't even young. She was 39. So there, there are really interesting stories like that. But routinely, uh, routinely, we are able to do TESA over and over again, but only if we don't do any damage with the first TESA. OK. And do you, sometimes you have cases with round spermatite and no sperm. Sometimes you have such patients. Did you, did you find similar cases? Well, uh, say that question again. I, I didn't quite hear it. This is with rounded spermatid arrest with no spermatoid oh. during micro tasting. So I know there are some people that uh, claim they can find round spermatids when there's no mature sperm. Uh, most of the people that have done that in the past medical history were just injecting Sertoli cell nuclei, and so they were just creating cleavage. I know some cases and, and uh, that it was actually fraudulent because the witnesses told me that it, they were really injecting sperm. My experience is that if there is a round sperm, we always look for round spermatids just for academic reasons. But my experience is, is if we find a round spermatid, we'll find a mature sperm. Okay, thank you. Dr. Mohammed Araf, maybe you have some questions to Dr. Silver? Um, yes, there are some questions from the from the audience. Uh, can I uh, ask them? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, there is one question uh, regarding uh, the age, effect of age in uh, obstructive azospermia uh, for the reconstructive surgery or ICSI. Uh, do you find any uh, uh, correlation with age in, in, in cases with um, reconstructive surgery? Uh, well, of course, the correlation with age, it's a very interesting question, by the way, fa fabulous question. Obviously, we now know the age of the wife is crucial. Now, as far as the age of the husband is concerned, uh, there are two questions. The first question is, in general, do older men have sperm that are not as good as younger men? We know from studies a long time ago that a man in his 80s sperm count on average, a huge population is about 15% lower than a man in his 40s. Uh, Rupert Amon did those studies, really good studies. It's classical, we know that, that there's some diminution, but, but it's not enough to make a difference, really. But what about mutations? We know there are certain rare genetic diseases like osteodystrophy that are um, uh, slightly more common in older men. It, it's not anything really to worry about because it's so rare, but it definitely is more common in older men. Well, as I showed you, uh, almost all mutations in humans come from the testicle because of the continual 
mitosis, and they, they almost never come from the ovary. Maybe aneuploidy, obviously aneuploidy does, but mutations don't come from the ovary because those eggs aren't mitotically dividing. And uh, so at least mutations that are carried over to the next generation. But uh, in sperm, the progenitor spermatogonia mutations, which are plentiful, are not gonna go into the next generation. Uh, but uh, so the, the spermatogonial stem cells are protected because they divide so slowly. So it's been calculated. There's about two mutations uh, per year in, uh, in the uh, spermatogonia, and, uh, and those mutations uh, will be carried on to the next generation. Those two mutations are obviously one in 100,000 times damaging, and the rest of the time they're insignificant. They're like polymorphisms. Now, in terms of the duration of obstruction, the longer the period of obstruction, the, the, the more blowouts you're gonna find and the higher up they'll be in the epididymis. And vasoepididymostomy to the head of the epididymis is always more difficult than to the cauda epididymis. So uh, the duration of obstruction can create some uh, technical problems. I tried to make it an all-encompassing answer to the question of aging in the male. Okay, so uh, another interesting question is, uh, in case of chromosomal abnormality like Klein-Filter syndrome, do you recommend for uh, PGT uh, uh, pre-implantation genetic uh, testing or uh, you don't go for it and you go direct for ICSI? Originally, we did uh, uh, genetic testing because nobody really understood Klein-Filter syndrome. But now what we know is that both Klein-Filter's uh, and Turner's uh, are mosaics, whether, whether you know they're mosaics or not. In other words, you might check 20 blood cells uh, in a routine karyotype and, they're, you know, uh, and see they're 46 uh, or 47 X, XXY. But if you look at 50,000 cells, you're gonna find some normal 46 XY cells. Those are the cells that represent the tubule that's actually got normal spermatogenesis. The, uh, the XXY cells won't make sperm. So now we know that we really don't have to worry about uh, the genetics uh, of the child. Other than with severe oligospermia, whether it's Klein filters or not, there is a higher incidence of aneuploidy, uh, sex chromosomal aneuploidy. So about 2%, about 0.2% of males births normally are Klein filters about 0.8% of uh, births from <coughs> severe oligospermia are Klein-Felters. So we know that Klein-Felters is increased in the presence of severe oligospermia. We don't know why, but it's not increased anymore in the sons of Klein-Felter patients. Okay. So uh, uh, another question from the audience. Uh, regarding uh, in the cases with uh, failed uh, initial uh, TACI. Uh, if you are going to do re -tacy, do you give some stimulation before? Do you prepare the patient or you just go for the TACI as the first one without any preparation? No, I don't give the stimulation. Uh, actually, I can't say I'm against it because it's not gonna do any harm if you give both FSH and LH. Uh, I think it does harm if you give just FSH, but if you give FSH and LH, it doesn't do any harm, but I don't think it does any good. But here's my strategy for that. Uh, I, I didn't mention before, I would like to give six months of recovery for, from a TESA before doing another TESA. So I think the best strategy is to only do TESA on one side. Mm -hmm. And then if you found nothing, uh, they can come back a few months later and do TESA on the other side and you can alternate back and forth because they'll be very anxious and you don't have to tell them to wait six months that way. Okay. So uh, a lot of other questions are asking about, is there any way uh, like ultrasound or Doppler that you can determine the site of sperm uh, in, uh, in retrieval uh, during TESA, before TESA? Uh, is there any way that you can determine which side you can find sperm or at which site in the testicle you can find sperm? We mm -hmm. haven't been able to, to do that. Uh, it hasn't worked for us. Uh, you can see we're pretty good with testicular ultrasound but uh, it's just too small to really make out whether there's sperm or not. Uh, now, th there is a study done by Brian Herman. I'm one of the authors uh, in the middle of 20 authors, so I, all I did was provide the, the material. 
but you can find it by Brian Hermit Beautiful, a, um, a, 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 a RNA um, a study of uh, testicular biopsies in uh, very men with normal spermatogenesis and poor. And uh, that might be okay in the future because it's highly, highly critical. So you'd hope maybe you, I don't know that this will work, but maybe you could do a testis biopsy. Well, no, this is what would work. Sorry, I'm thinking out loud. You do your TESA and you're looking for a sperm, but you also save a small portion of it right where you, uh, right where you took your, your testicular tubules from and you do a RNA transcriptome analysis on that. That way, let's say you don't find any sperm on TESA. Maybe, maybe you just weren't looking well enough. It's so hard to keep your focus on it. Your embryologists go batty trying to keep their focus for three or four hours to find the sperm. Sometimes they go right past it and don't see it. But then if you can do the RNA transcriptome analysis on, your, uh, on the other half of that tissue that you took out, you can find out if you miss sperm because that's very accurate. Thank you. Uh, I think Dr. Wael can uh, check if he wants to ask any questions or to convey other questions from the audience. Yeah, just one, one question. Do you, do you perform a Y chromosome microdeletion analysis as a routine before TC? Uh, yes, I, I think that now the Y chromosome analysis I think is, is important because uh, uh, we, we have a different nomenclature uh, than the standard. The standard is AZFA, AZFB, AZFC, because it's so easy to use that nomenclature. Actually, it's not exactly accurate. I mean, we talk about B2, B4, and P1, P5. You can see that in our articles. But for simple simplicity, let's say it's a B2, B4, AZFC deletion. You will virtually always find sperm in those cases. And that's because the mechanism is a deletion of the DAS gene, and there's a DASL uh, backup gene on chromosome three. It, it's not as good as DAS, but it is a, a backup gene. So if it's AZFC deleted, you almost always find sperm. Is if AZFB deleted, it's almost always maturation arrest. And uh, so far, we've never found sperm. We keep doing it for academic reasons, and if the patient. It, it, wants to do that but so that i think the the why analysis is important azfa is very rare but there, there won't be any sperm if it's azfa either okay thank you uh, do you have any a... no so um if uh, i'd like to follow up on uh, Dr. Zodi's question a little bit for a second because uh, I see we have another minute or so left and um, I, I could talk about the Y deletion for the, the Y chromosome and the X chromosome for a whole hour uh, and what he brought up is fascinating because we're only aware of the genetic causes of 25% of non-obstructive vasospermia. The other 75% are are still a mystery, uh, and uh, but I'm suspecting that if we ever can do a good sequence on the X chromosome, we will find a lot of cases are related to deletions in the amplicanic region of the X chromosome. Uh, because at least in the mouse study, uh, Jeremy Wang found a long time ago that there were a huge amount of tested specific genes that were on the X chromosome. Uh, and you might not think of that necessarily, but what they found was that genes that were um, favorable spermatogenesis that were recessive would be more likely to pa be passed in the X chromosome than in other chromosomes because the X as yeah. a recessive chromosome will still be fully expressed. So yeah. uh, we got a long ways to go to look for these genetic causes. So I, I, I thank you for giving me the segue. Okay, uh, Dr. Chairman, I have two final questions. Oh, okay. The first one, would you accept our honorary membership and boardship? Would you accept our honorary membership and boardship? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I would love that. I, I'd be honored by that. 
The second question, would you like, you, you accept our invitation for June two to four uh, next year to our meeting? Absolutely, I accept now. It, it, whatever day, tell me the date, I'll put it on my calendar, nothing else will replace it. I will send it to Pam. <laughs> yes, that would be great. By the way, Pam says, I, 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 don't, I, I have to embarrass you in front of your colleagues, but I gotta tell you, Pam said you are the most wonderful person to work with. She oh. absolutely <laughs> loves you. <laughs> She's wonderful, she was wonderful. I would like to introduce Professor Hassan Maghrabi, uh, the president of EFRI, the president of our foundation. We want to welcome you. And uh, the Professor Hassan, please. Professor Silber, welcome to our uh, meeting. We are honored to have you with us, sir. You've always continued to impress me and enlighten me for 30 years. Uh, you are an inspiration for my generation and for other younger generations always innovative, always thinking, always working, from my heart, sir. So I, I really am very happy that you accepted Professor Madhati's invitation to our meeting next year and our honorary membership and our honorary boardship. Thank you very much for being with us. I have two other questions, but I will not say them. I'll send them to you. <laughs> okay, thank you uh, very much from the bottom of my heart also. I, I love you all. Professor Silber, this is from your friend, uh, Dr. Botros Rez. Ah. <laughs> okay, he wants yeah. to ask you, how long will it take to make sperm? Okay, so um, Thank you. generally, from the spermatogonial uh, progenitor cells, spermatogonia, to sperm in the ejaculate should be approximately 84 or more days. It wouldn't be less. 72 days from spermatogonia in the in a four and a half stages you saw, uh, 16 days per stage, and then you got a half a stage. Uh, and so it would be certainly 72 days from spermatogonia to mature sperm. But then add another 11 days usually for epididymal sperm transport. So uh, normally you should count on three months if it's just recovery from testosterone. But if they've uh, had uh, chemotherapy or gonadotoxic therapy of any kind, we all know clinically it could be three or four years later. And that's because you're relying on those stem cells, which are very, very slowly dividing, therefore much more resistant to chemotherapy or, um, uh, or radiation. And your, those stem cells will take a long time to uh, actually show up because they're so slowly dividing. So then after radiation or chemo, it could take three years for recovery of spermatogenesis. Thank you very much, sir. But I'm, I'm sure that Botros will ask you personally about this again. <laughs> 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 you will not stop. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.